Good evening. I'm Liz Kruger, and you're joining me and Professor Charles Platkin for a discussion about healthy eating and food safety in a time of COVID-19. I'm going to remind those of you who are listening in on your phones, please remain on mute. This is not the kind of, of call-in show where you get to speak. If you're watching on Facebook, there will be an opportunity for you to be able to type in questions. As I start everything I do nowadays, I'm reminding you all, I'm delighted you're with us. I'm delighted you're healthy enough to be with us and that you're all being smart and staying safe. I can't say this enough. Wear a mask when you go outside, keep six feet apart from other people, and wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds as often as possible, particularly when you leave your home, even if you're just touching the doorknobs of your building to go get your mail before you come back. I'm also reminding everyone as frequently as I can about absentee ballots. Elections are more important than ever, but people may be worried about showing up at polling sites to vote. So there's a June 23rd primary election. You can get your absentee ballot from the Board of Election. Everyone can vote absentee. You can get the application online at elections.ny.gov or call the Board of Election, 1-866-868-3692. And make sure you give yourself the time to fill out the application for it. Then you get a ballot, you get the ballot sent back in. We will also have early voting. We will also have regular voting. So despite everything going around us, I don't think there's any excuse for failing to vote this year. Let's talk about the census, also a critical thing for those of us in New York. We have to make sure we are filling out our census forms, either the form that came in the mail or can be done on computer. Whether New York State gets its fair share of money from the federal government for the next 10 years, whether we get a fair share of representation in Congress is all dependent on all of us filling out those forms because if we don't get counted, we get short shrift in the national distribution of money and congressional seats. So again, just want to reemphasize, a lot of us are sitting at home every day. There's no excuse for not filling out the census or getting it done online. So now let's get to tonight's event. Tonight we are going to be talking about food safety and security. We will cover a range of top topics from how to safely unpack your food from the store, how to address food insecurity and hunger, what you can do to plan to develop a sustainable food supply system in the future. So it's now and the future. And we have a great deal of information to cover. So I want to get started and I want to share with you, sorry, that tonight, Charles Platkin, the executive director of the Hunter College New York City Food Policy Center and editor of dietdetective.com. Again, all one word, dietdetective.com is our special guest. And I will be asking him questions, but we're also open to additional questions. So if you want to type them into the section on Facebook, they will show up on my screen so that after the presentation, I'll be able to moderate a Q&A session, which includes questions we've thought through in advance and questions you've added during Facebook. It's now my pleasure to introduce Charles Platkin, and he's going to be going through um, sort of section by section, a whole presentation for you before we get to the Q&A. Charles, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me, Liz. I really do appreciate it, and I'm excited to be here. This is my district, and you are my senator, and thank you for all you do. It really is appreciated. Great. So, Charles, let's start with at home. What are the important things we should know about in food at home at this time? So, 
recently we had an event um a, a zoom event and you know we had more than 600 people on and we were discussing with two experts world-renowned experts on food safety um and you know, i prepared you know all these questions and you know i i did a lot of homework and and worked with them and i figured out a few things okay so they didn't really want to have a panic with people and they were wanted to be very careful and i understood that but these are the kinds of things that I kind of gathered as a journalist, as a researcher, as an expert in the, in the area is, you know, one, like you said before, washing hands is so critical, right? So let's say you do go to the grocery store or you get a delivery. You want to handle everything and you want to make sure that before you do anything, uh, after you, you know, get the food in the house, you want to make sure that you, you know, wash your hands every time you're handling. Right? So, you know, kind of that's the basics of it. Now, I think that one of the things that you also want to do is to make sure that you, you know, plastic, as we know, uh, retains um, the virus, okay? So I had, you know, when I was talking to these experts, the first thing I said was, oh, um, how does the, can the virus live on food? And I was quickly corrected. The virus doesn't live. The virus sustains itself. So can the virus sustain itself on food? Can it sustain itself on plastic? Can it sustain itself on, on cardboard? The answer is most likely yes, right? There was a New England Journal of Medicine study, which is a very you know well-respected journal that came out and said that it does sustain itself on plastic um, for up to 72 hours and on cardboard for up to 24 hours. So those were, that's a real, I know people see it in the media, but I lo looked at and read the journal. So yes. So food i thought okay can it live on food on the surface All right, on an orange tomato an egg an avocado so you know my thoughts were when i questioned the food safety experts and i did my own research um yes it probably can sustain itself on a, a food surface does that mean you're going to get it and it's how quickly um you know can it can it happen the answer is i don't think experts completely know so what i'm doing is when I get food in my house, from all the research and knowledge that I've gained over the past you know, two months, is we, first of all, let it sit, okay? Things that can spoil, we put away, um, but we don't touch them, we put them away, and then we wash our hands, okay? Oftentimes, for each of the surfaces of a milk container, of an egg carton, we have a very, 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 very mild, I'm talking about, like an eyedropper full of soap and a big thing of water, and it's mostly water, we will wipe down the surfaces, okay? It's been, it's known that soap um, sort of dismantles this virus, okay? That doesn't mean you take and wash your food with soap, no. So I think that's sort of the general picture of, you know, washing the surfaces of, 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 of the food crates and things like that. Every time you touch the plastic, you should, you know, either, have gloves and then take the gloves off like you would have, like a surgeon does. Um, or you wash your hands immediately and make sure you don't touch your face. So some of us know, or hopefully all of us know, that despite President Trump's suggestion, we're not supposed to be swallowing or injecting Lysol and Clorox into our bodies. But are we supposed to be spraying down our food with that kind of stuff? You know, and that's a great question because, uh, you know, my mom, who is not listening because she's not here, and I, I, I don't want to be able to, free, to speak freely about her. Um, you know, she's 82, 81, and, um, you know, when she was getting food delivery, she was spraying everything down with Lysol. And I said, please, please don't do that. You know, I, I think that you don't want Lysol to, you know, contaminate your food. You don't want to be in a situation where you do something that puts you in a worse position than you would if um, you just touched the surfaces, right? Um, the likelihood that the surfaces are gonna get you infected are probably low. Um, I'm very risk averse, but I would not spray it with Lysol. That's unnecessary at this particular time, right? And I mean, we, or, or I would think ever, I'm not doing that. And, I, and I'm very careful. So don't use Lysol. Do not use bleach at all, okay, with your food, and do not use Lysol with your food or any other cleaning product. Right. 
stove. So that's in the home. And then when we go out to grocery stores, grocery stores, farmers markets, bodegas, I know usually we think of local food as actually being preferred in terms of food safe safety and nutritional value and even environmental value. Um, but is there any reason we should be concerned about food that's grown and sold in say green markets in New York City and state because we are living with such high rates of infection here? So I think, you know, again, it's the people that you should be most concerned about. Um, I think, you know, most people are wearing masks, which is fantastic. You know, it's important to remember the masks from what we know in the research, they protect you, they're protecting others from you having the virus. They're not, unless you have an N95 mask, which really are for healthcare workers, you're not necessarily protected. But what you're doing is if everybody wears masks, it significantly reduces the opportunity for you to become infected, right? So when you go to the grocery store, you want to keep in mind that you should have a mask on. But there's no question about it. And you want to you know, make sure you socially distance. Most grocery stores are, um, you know, having lanes and, and, and making sure that you're safe and socially distanced by marking the floors. Um, that's important. You know, we, we worry about grocery store workers. Um, you know, they're wearing masks now and you should be wearing masks too. You want to make sure that you do not touch your face if anything. Um, if, if, if you think, oh, why should I be wearing a mask? Just use it as a reminder not to touch your face, okay? And that alone is so important. Right. Um, so whether it's delivered to your house or it's at a grocery store, is there any special things we should think about um, as far as eating meat in today's world or eating fish or sushi, which is raw fish? Are there different ways we should be approaching these foods right now? Yes. So first I want to go back to the local question. I just wanted to, because I didn't really answer that exactly. I think that a, quite the contrary, um, local foods are, uh, they're handled less. Okay. It's really farmer right to the green market and green market, uh, growing what I see green market is doing an incredible, incredible job of making sure the farmers are safe, making sure the people that go to green markets are safe. They're putting, you know, using social distancing and markings and, and plexiglass. I mean, they're really doing an incredible job. So um, I encourage people, farmers are doing, local farmers are doing incredibly well, and that's really important for the local economy and really important for the food system. So just to answer that, then I'll go and answer your question about, um, uh, Me, uh, about sushi. sushi. Yeah. So, so sushi, you know, one of the things that concerned me, and it was interesting because on our talk that I had, uh, about a week and a half ago, um, I had asked that question. And it was funny because there's a Harvard Medical School uh, physician who I is pretty famous and you know he's a, he's a brain expert and he was happy to have been on the call and he was me. And he emailed me and he asked that question. He was laughing because he saw that I was frustrated on the responses I was getting. And he emailed and said, you know, I just want to know when I get my sushi home, do I have to cook it? You know, and you know, I think the answer is, I'm a little concerned about raw fish. It depends on how quickly um, it, it comes to you. But I think the key thing for me is know your restaurant, okay? I, I can't emphasize that enough. Know the restaurant, know how they you know, typically behave. You can even go, the, um, the city has restaurant inspections. If anybody really wants to look, they can see not current restaurant inspections, but they can see how the restaurant behaved in the past. And that's a really good indicator of how they're gonna behave in the future, right? So I think that, you know, you wanna, I, I would look, I'm not afraid, okay, <laughs> to see whether, you know, what was going on at that restaurant. And I think it's it, it's probably helpful to see what their, what their uh, rating is and what violations they've had in the past. If they were critical, it's all online. You just have to plug in your restaurant and it comes right up. So I think that that's a good measure and also, most people know what restaurants they go to. Are they practicing safe measures? Do they practice safe measures in the past? Are they washing their hands? Are the bathrooms clean? I think all those are an indicator. And you want a restaurant, especially in today's day, to be an act according to CDC and FDA safety guidelines and also New York City Health Department guidelines. 
which are very stringent, by the way. It's about hand washing. It's about safety. I asked the question, what happens if someone sneezes on my sushi that was infected? So the expert said to me, uh, no one should be sneezing on your food. <laughs> so, you know, and I get that, but I, it, it wasn't enough for me. So um, I want to make sure that the restaurant practices safe measures. You know, and I, I personally like my fish cooked, but I'm also fascinated with how serious a Japanese sushi restaurant is about only the most pristine fish, only the most careful and delicate handling of food. So I must admit, if I was a sushi eater, I would feel like, oh, there's no reason I should worry about that at this time because those restaurants that specialize in raw fish um, are extraordinarily careful in handling and, food all the time. And, and, they, and they, that's kind of their expertise, right? Is, is, is sushi right. is an art and a science um, and safety is critical for, for them. So, uh, you know, um, they do practice very safe, uh, you know, I can't say every restaurant, but, you know, again, that's the idea of knowing your restaurant. And I think that there's other key things with restaurants and eating out, if you, if you don't mind, can I run through them just quickly? Um, you want to make sure that there's safe handling practices. Make sure that the, the food is cooked properly, right? So if you get it home and it's lukewarm, you want to make sure that you reheat it to a high temperature, right? To, you know, whatever would be hot, right, that you would like to eat it at. Don't just, you know, uh, eat it. And, and quite frankly, pizza is a very safe food, not necessarily the healthiest, but it's a very safe food. The research is showing that very hard to get infected. It sits on, on there and you know, doesn't really get uh, a lot of disease, <laughs> um, no matter how it sits out. So that's just a quick point. Great. Although we would all have other issues if all we were doing was eating pizza all the time. And I don't recommend that. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rare food, not an everyday food. Right. And you touched on something else already, which I think is fairly obvious. If somebody is sick and they're handling your food, whether it's at a restaurant or at a supermarket or bodega, this is not the food you want to be taking home with you or eating. So if they are sneezing, coughing, frankly, if they're working in the stores without masks with open food, that's not the food I would want to be buying at this point in history. And I think you would agree. You yeah, and that's the kind of judgment that I'm, that's the kind of judgment that I'm recommending, right? You know, again, yeah. know the restaurant, know the store, know their practices, um, I probably, I personally would avoid, you know, salad bars and open uh, food, but that's just me. I'm not saying it's not safe. I, I, I would probably not go there. I'd want it to be protected and, you know, with food handlers that are wearing masks and, and, and gloves. And quite frankly, you know, we, I went to a place a, to a curbside takeout and um, I was very impressed. The uh, person handed the food, put it in, you know, our, our car and then took their gloves off. And you know, you know properly, okay, which is a very certain art, you know, and um, put on a new pair of gloves, and I was impressed with that. So I think that that's important. And I just one other thing about gloves, you know, people think that it's protecting them, but it's not really going to see through your skin the virus. Um, and most people mishandle gloves, so the hand washing is so important, as you said in the beginning, critical. Right, you just cannot emphasize it enough. All right, let's jump into the section we decided to call nutrition, healthy eating, and fitness. So stress eating, oh my God, we're all trapped in our homes. There's a certain level of anxiety in all of our lives because of what's going on in the world around us. And it's certainly impacting behavior changes in every one of us. And stress eating is a really common response. So help us figure out what that means and what we can do about it if we're finding that that's happening to us and our loved ones. Sure, you know, this is, you know, something that we noticed in, uh, during 9 11, after, right after 9 11, um, and I did research in that area, and we started after the recession of 2008 and 2009. And I think that what happens is that you, you know, stress, whenever you're stressed or, or high, you know, emotional, uh, uh, have high emotional issues, we tend to um, eat. Uh, comfort foods, right? So we go to those comfort foods because it's biological and physiological. So the biological component is is that it actually does relax us, okay? Because it may, you know, um, it 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 offers uh, 
the sugar has an impact on the fat, but, you know, reduces your emotions and makes you feel better, right? And it releases hormones. The problem is, is that quickly, you know, it can, it can turn on you very quickly. So it feels in the short term, but in the long term, you'll feel lethargic. You won't feel as good. You'll feel, you could feel down afterwards. So it's really, you know, food is, is medicine, food is a drug. The other component is physiologic, uh, excuse me, the physiological I said, the other is psychological. Um, when you eat comfort food, it actually reminds you of a time when you were, you know, whether your parents gave you ice cream if you had a bad day or you had a cookie, oh, why don't you have a cookie? Because, you know, you had, you know, a difficult time or a difficult phone call, you got a bad grade and we remember that. So you have the physical, physiological and the psychological. Right. So they're both impacting you. So it's easy to go for that, you know, cookie. And I have to tell you, the first two weeks, here I am. I've been studying this, talking about it for 25 years. I have to tell you, I was eating like in, in like it was like there was no tomorrow. And I had to, anecdotally, I had two groups of friends, ones that were doing the same thing I was. And then there was the other group that said, I'm going to use this and take advantage of this time. And you know, we're exercising and they were doing you know, eating, they went vegan, you know, and within two weeks, you know, they were, they had gained their weight back and, or they had went off that program and now it's over. Um, the antithesis is I was, you know, and, and other people, other group that I know was basically doing that. And they realized that that's not sustainable. You know, we need to, if we keep a habit up that is going to, um, you know, develop a new habit, especially during the stressful time. We don't want that new that new bad habit to stick. We want to try to really think about developing new, stronger, better behaviors, and this is the time to do it, right? To it's first of all, it's springtime, and oftentimes we think New Year's is the time to kind of like, oh, well, I make a resolution. Actually, the spring is the best time because there it's the time of you know of, of awakening, right? You know the, the the buds are out and the flowers are coming out and things like that. So I think that this is the better time to start new, fresh behaviors and make, make sure. And, and, and I think one of the other things is that not to get worried that you were doing so horribly on your diet or your exercise routine. No, I think that you can start immediately. Right? Don't get caught up in that. And then I hear people say about exercise, um, oh, I don't have the time. I'm busy on Zoom calls all day long, and I don't. I'm unfeeling safe going outside. There's so much material online. I mean, a plethora of material um, that about in-home workouts. I mean, fantastic stuff. That most of it's free. That you can, you know, just go on YouTube and and other sources. Even AceFitness.org, which is uh, with personal trainers, it's a licensing organization and a nonprofit. They have videos for in-home workouts that are phenomenal for free. Right. And remind us why there's a correlation between smart eating and good nutrition and keeping ourselves healthy, because frankly, this is the time where all of us really, really do want to keep ourselves healthy. One, we want to be strong if the COVID virus comes a hunting for us. And two, let's yeah. be honest. Nobody wants to get sick and need to go to a doctor or a hospital for anything else because pretty much the last thing you want to do, with all due respect, is go near a frontline worker um, in a hospital setting. So and I couldn't agree more. Yeah, so I think that that's really important to understand. I think that, number one, oftentimes when we're trying to change, you know, bad behavior to a good behavior, it's really good to have a – reason why, W-H-Y. Well, if this isn't enough of a reason why, um, I, I can't imagine what would be. And staying healthy, eating lots of fruits and vegetables. By the way, they have incredible antioxidants, vitamins. I mean, vegetables and, you know, vegetables and fruit are powerful. I mean, powerful. I mean, you can't have missed all the news and information. Maybe you gloss it over or people gloss it over, but now is the time to sort of recognize right? Whole grains, eating healthy. Not only will you be shocked at how good you feel, um, you are protecting yourself. I mean, there's real information there. And I, you know, I know that people listening might think, oh, you know, uh, another health expert telling us, oh, they should eat, you know, better foods. But as much bad food as I might have uh, consumed during those first two weeks, I was still eating, um, 
so much of the healthy stuff, right? And I think that that's sort of important, right? Um, for people to recognize, even though you might be eating some unhealthy foods, it's important to, you know, really go after the healthy stuff because it will protect you. It will make you feel better. And, you know, when you're sitting inside and you kind of feel locked in, um, eating the unhealthy foods, I guarantee will make you feel worse uh, over time. And it impacts your mental health and all of those kinds of things. And that rolls us right into, you know, good, healthy nutrition to stay healthy and fitness and exercise to stay healthy. So even those of us who don't run miles or bike miles, we are a city of walkers and now we can't even get outside and walk. So do you have any good recommendations for us about why it's important to figure out a new way um, to be doing some exercise and keeping that part of our lives? I mean, the correlation and the, the, the impact of exercise on your mental health is enough and should be enough. Not only all the other benefits um, that are just incredible from exercise. I mean, you can dance, you know, and, and by the way, I think this is a big misstep for people. They think, well, I don't want to do 30 minutes, you know, okay, do five, do 10. Um, you know, I have an exercise machine and today, uh, you know, I, I, I see myself skipping. I usually exercise. I mean, I always go for, a, you know, uh, a walk if I can, if I feel it's early enough and no one's out. Um, but, you know, I have this exercise machine and I don't want to use it. I'll be honest with you, but I try to squeeze in even 10 minutes, even though I don't feel as good, but you know, that, that I'm not doing a full hour or something, but just 10 minutes. And if I, sometimes I'll do it twice a day, 10 minutes, and that's great. So try, I think, to not limit yourself and feel like, oh, it's only 10 minutes or I only have five minutes. Try to squeeze it in and whatever you're doing, um, and multiple times a day is actually, you know, as good or even better sometimes because it could be less injury um, than doing it all at once. So go online, you could dance, you could um, watch videos, uh, exercise videos um, that you could watch. There's uh, people that are broadcasting on YouTube just to help others out um, with fitness routines. So I encourage people, and you know, if this is something we can come up with a list and we could post it maybe, you know, um, and uh, give it, and, and you know, certainly not to plug, you know, or the website dietdetective.com, but everything is free. It's a nonprofit. Um, you could go on there. There's 900 articles about fitness, exercise, nutrition. Um, you know, over 20 years, and most of them are evergreen and, and still current. So I encourage people to go there too. Great. So let's spend a few minutes before we get to the Q and A, um, talking about some of the other issues that are so relevant right now. Um, fears about food shortage and the supply, um, reality of food insecurity and hunger for people who may have lost their jobs and so they are living on a much lower basis of income. Um, I never go anywhere without talking about the SNAP program and how important a benefit that can be for people who just, for whatever reason, they don't have enough money to meet their food needs so even if you thought you would never imagine applying for a government benefit, I want everybody watching to know that the SNAP program, which is a card that looks just like anybody else's credit card, that you can buy food in food stores and farmers markets. Um, we've made it much easier to apply. The, jet, the benefits are more generous right now. So I do hope people, if they, if they feel they don't have adequate money to buy food, that they will look into the SNAP program. And I know that you have put together some guides um, about how people can find food resources. So can you tell us a little bit, a little bit about the guides, Charles? Yes, yeah, sure. We, you know, at the Food Policy, the Hunter College New York City Food Policy Center, we put together 59 neighborhood food guides. And um, these guides give resources in your community, right? So whatever community you live in, um, you can access the guides at nycfoodpolicy.org forward slash food. nycfoodpolicy.org forward slash food. You go there and you see all 59 neighborhoods. And if you click on your neighborhood, you'll be able to see all the resources, every supermarket, open and close, and what the delivery center. 
bodegas. Um, you'll see food pantries and soup kitchens that you know um, we, we update them every single day. We have more than uh, 75 volunteers making phone calls every single day and updating these 59 guides um, and making sure we have the most current information. The food pantry data and the soup kitchen data is the most robust um, that is available in, in the city. Okay, we, we take five different sources and pull them together. So we don't want somebody going out to a food pantry or a soup kitchen and finding out that it's closed. We want to make sure that, you know, when they do go and venture out, that it's safe and that they're hitting the, their target, right? So um, these guys uh, have things like that, and they tell you how to apply for SNAP online, um, you know, which, which is very important to go to H, H, HRA uh, Access, Access HRA, um, which I'll, I'll say the URL in, in a moment. But I think that we, we spent a lot of time pulling these guys together, and we've noticed that, you know, food insecurity and hunger um, are so relevant now, and, and the SNAP enrollment is much higher than it's ever been, um, and we are concerned that, you know, people who are living paycheck to paycheck aren't able to make ends meet and making decisions that are very uncomfortable. It's not an embarrassment. It's no shame involved. Food is a human right. Food is a human right, and everybody should be, have access to healthy, powerful food. And that means fruits, vegetables, um, whole grains, and we need to remember that. You know, so like you said, you know, applying for SNAP or assistance is without question. You should, no one should even hesitate about taking advantage of that program if it's available to them. Um, and you know, just to just to get it out there, um, and I'm sure you, you, you're, you're you know you have this you know on your website or could put it there. It's access.nyc.gov, um, and you know SNAP you know provides assistance for for New Yorkers. Um, all just to keep you know some of the information out there. Human Resources Administration. Um, all the appointments were canceled. The physical appointments, but you can go online and there are people that will help you. Um, and uh, I think that's one of the call uh, seven eight seven six two seven nine. Um, and take some time. I think it's other days. Charles, I think we've uh, lost you for a minute. Your voice sort of went away, and now your face has gone away. I'll see if my staff will type to me. Oh, you're back. Okay. Okay. Hi. <laughs> now your voice still and your face is frozen and a nice smile, um, but you're not. Okay. Let me see. Okay. Are we back? You're you're partly back. <laughs> okay. You're this laughing. Is, this is I think everybody's watching TV. That's why uh, my internet is. Uh, I understand. <laughs> this is the world Netflix. we're living in. And yes. I was just so I appreciate your highlighting the SNAP. I wanted to just also add, um, you know, the city is providing delivery of three meals a day to seniors um, who apply. Call into three one one, or if anyone is having problems with any of these programs. Um, they should certainly feel free to call my office during the work hours, and we will follow up. We're doing that every day for people. So I know particularly for seniors who, you know, they can't necessarily get out of home that easily, um, particularly now, and they're not necessarily able to always cook for themselves, and they might have been going to senior centers, but they're closed for now. Um, the city is working really hard to get um, – senior citizens prepared meals. So I also wanted to just highlight that. All right, so now we're gonna to jump to Q&A, okay? Yes. Good. You um, hear me okay now, of, yes? Great, a lot of questions really focus on the food safety. Um, so we talked about, you talked about, you know, the packaging of food and being careful of that. Does the food itself carry the virus for any extended period of time, do we know? 
You know, we, we, we don't know that specifically. I think that if it's living, you know, my thoughts were if it's living on your hands, if it's living on cardboard, if it's living on plastic, there's a chance, excuse me, not living, I got to correct myself, sustaining itself on packages and plastic, it probably has some sustainability on food surfaces. And, it, you know, again, not to scare anybody, but I would practice caution and make sure you wash your fruit and vegetables and make sure you wash them carefully. We don't, as we discussed before, we don't recommend um, using soap or any kind of bleach at all. Do not touch your food with those contaminants, okay? Water and also having it sit. I would probably, if it's if it's okay and doesn't spoil, I would probably have my uh, food sit, you know, for 24 hours um, just to make sure that the virus hasn't sustained itself. Right. Now, somebody typed in a question about how they were being very organized about when they bring the food home and they're washing the produce, but that anything they bring in that's not, I guess, has to that doesn't have to be refrigerated, they're just letting it sit in the bag on the floor for five days on the theory that anything will die. That seems like a very long time to me, but maybe that's really smart and prudent. I, you know, I think that I think that it's a little overzealous, but honestly, you know, I, I'm not going to st sit here, you know, and, and tell somebody if they can sustain it for five days. I think that's probably it's not terrible, but I'm, that's not the recommendations. That's not the research. But you know what? I would never tell someone not to do something like that, um, not to let their food spoil. But certainly if it's OK and it's packaged goods and shelf stable. Absolutely. Why not? If they don't mind, then that's totally fine with me. And I will not sit here and tell them not to. One thing I will say, though, um, is is about putting food in the freezer. Um, I was sort of dumbfounded that the experts were saying that basically it sustains, it, it slows the viruses, um, uh, you know, death down, basically. So um, not that you shouldn't freeze food, but if you can wait. Um, or give it a longer period of time before you go in and grab that, not a bad idea. Okay. And so people are also, they're just a little over worried that you bring food into your house, it's in bags, you take it out of the bags, then you're touching the bags again, then you're yeah. touching the food again. Um, so it seems to me probably you want to be really organized like take everything out at once, throw yeah. all the out external bags out, then wash each product, put it in a new container if you're concerned about the kind of container it was in, um, and then you know work just sort of work thoughtfully through each product before you. Yeah, and I, and I think that that's away. that's a great idea. Also, by the way, if you have that mask. Maybe it's not a bad idea if you think you're going to touch your face while you're doing this whole process, put the mask on as a reminder. It's not going to protect you from anything, but as a reminder not to touch your fat, you know, mouth, nose, or eyes, right? Um, and, you know, or, or whatever you need to do as a reminder. Put up a, put up a, see me touching, but I'm, I haven't seen anybody in months. <laughs> but you, know, you can put up a sign while you're washing everything, you know, don't touch face, you know, at all. Right. Just something to remind you, because that's really important. And as you said in the beginning, it's the constant washing your hands and with soap, because that's that soap. Think of grease, because that's kind of the virus is a fat, is, is a fat right? Um, an RNA fat, I believe. Right. So the grease cuts it. So, I mean, excuse me, the, 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 the soap cuts it. Right. But for your hands and your, you know, so not for your fruits and vegetables, but for your hands. So that's what's important, because it cuts it. And then when you touch your face, you're okay, right? So I think that, you know, while you're handling the fruits and vegetables and the, and the produce and, excuse me, the, um, the delivery or the uh, grocery shopping, you want to be really careful and conscious about every move you make, not rushing or panicking, right? Um, and, and honestly, I don't, you know, anything that's shelf stable, I do think it's a good idea for at least 24 hours to leave it and let it sit. I think it's, it's not a bad practice. We're still so early in discovering what this virus does to people and what it does to on surfaces and things like that. Those practices are not, they're not at all out of line. Right. 
So you you touched on the freezing food. What about cooking food? Does cooking kill the the virus? Very important. Yes. I mean, cooking. You know, we know from food safety, right? Practicing good food safety, cooking your foods to proper temperatures, and all that stuff is available on the CDC website. You know, what temperatures and and so forth. But really, you know, when I talk to the experts about that, the key thing is just cooking it to for even at reaching any temperature, making sure the food's hot, that's what's critical in killing any, you know, bacteria or virus that might be living. It's good food safety practice, not to commingle your foods, your vegetables, your meats and things like that. Um, you know, there's good food safety practices, which are kind of standard um, that everybody should be practicing, right? Wash your hands, wash the surfaces around when you're, um, you know, you're preparing uh cooking for foods, when you're bringing groceries in, uh, don't cross-contaminate raw meat, poultry, seafood, um, you know, and so forth, because that spreads, you know, germs. So these are all um, normal food safety practices, and I think that they're probably really important, or I know they're really important to practice right now. Right, right. So I was once learning, well, I wasn't learning French cooking, trust me, I never learned it, but I was using a French <laughs> cookbook. And it taught me about blanching vegetables, where you boil them for a very short period of time so that they still keep their color and their crunch. Um, and it dawned on me, listening to you, that that probably would be a very reasonable approach also now, though, because there's a lot of questions about what about cauliflower? What about broccoli? How do I make sure that I've cleaned this correctly? Would blanching and boiling water for a minute or two be a good thing to do? I mean, it will probably, uh, you know, help to kill, to, to, to destroy the uh, sustainability of the virus. But, you know, I think that good washing is, is acceptable. You know, I, I just, I, you know, I'm very careful about giving somebody advice. Like I know that um, someone was talking about coffee. You know, should we pour coffee into it or its own container? I worry about that because you don't want to do one thing that causes another type of harm, right? You don't want boiling coffee, you know, or very burning hot coffee spilling on your hands or on your legs or surfaces. So we have to really think holistically and, and you know, have a, a, a wide view lens and be careful. That's why I worry about someone panicking, especially if you're older or you're bringing in the groceries, you're worried, you're, you know, you're in an apartment, you don't want, you know, you hear your neighbor's door and you trip, you know? So we need to be very conscious of our behaviors move slowly, carefully, deliberately. We don't want to end up in a hospital for, you know, a, a, a damaged you know, limb or a fracture or, you know, being hurt and having to get x-rays. I think we want to avoid that. So again, the blanching, you know, again, if you um, have dexterity and you're normally a cook um, and you do those kinds of things, yes, I think that's a good idea, but it makes me a little nervous with boiling hot water and you may be able to accomplish the same thing by running some hot, you know, letting the hot water run on, on there. Um, obviously, we don't want to ruin the fruits and vegetables. But again, I think um, that sounds like a really great idea. And I may probably because I am a cook, I may actually do that. But I don't you know, necessarily would be cautious about giving uh, having everybody do that. That's not normally what they would be you know, doing. And actually, you brought up the coffee example. Um, people have questions about, you know, how safe is the food that you might uh, get from a pickup location? Like, can you still go to Starbucks and get coffee to go? Or are you, are you supposed to be worried about handling the cup that the employee handled to make your coffee? Um, I think and- it's a very, you know, I, I mean, people might think that I'm overreacting. I think it's a real concern from a pu- as you know, public health person. Um, you know, people... I don't want to say anything negative about Starbucks or your local coffee person. And I shouldn't have named names. I'm sorry. So no, but coffee any, any okay. coffee place. And really, there are so many different coffee places. So any coffee place, I think it's about, you know, how they manage that coffee place, right? So if you've been there before and, you know, and, and most of them have windows you can look in, you know, if they, I would be concerned if they have paper on their windows and they're serving, you know, <laughs> they're serving you outside. That would concern me. Um, you know, most places you can look in, see how they're handling things. You know, remember, don't feel completely safe that you see a worker wearing gloves, okay? Don't be impressed with that because, 
you know, the gloves, you know, it's rubber, it can sustain the virus. So it's more about them, you know, washing their hands frequently, not, you know, um, making sure they don't look sick, um, making sure that the store or the place you're getting the coffee has a good reputation. Um, all those things matter to, to me and they should matter to, um, you know, the people, you know, in your district and who are listening. Um, so going back to food shopping, somebody had a question about, of course, we should be wearing the masks. I'm just, I'm just going to tell you that. When you go out, you're wearing the mask to protect yourself and to protect others. And food stores in New York City, particularly my neighborhoods in Manhattan, it's almost impossible to keep six feet apart from each other just because they're such narrow aisles. So I would say absolutely the mask. But do we need to wear gloves when we're food shopping? Does it help? us in like we're, we're taking a cart perhaps and we're pushing that cart we're touching yeah. things that somebody else might have touched intentionally or unintentionally what's your recommendation you know i don't you know a lot many some supermarkets have wipes they're offering if they if they were able to get so to wipe down the surfaces okay of the cart and so forth but i think the problem is is you know it was the gloves that if you're touching surfaces with the gloves and then touching your face, okay, or your eyes, that is problematic and it's the same as if, you know, you, you know, maybe your hands are a better conductor, but um, the gloves could potentially conduct and you're kind of eliminating the benefit, right? So the, the gloves is, it, it, it's kind of like if you have the gloves and you don't touch your face, you can then just, you know, you have to take the glove, this glove off like this and reverse it and then take the reverse glove and then you pinch it and you take this hand and you remove that glove and then you roll them inside out. And, and I don't think most people are practicing good glove safety in general. And if you think that that's protecting you, it's, it's, there's some very minor evidence that might, it could contract through your skin, but it's not going to happen. Um, from what I understand. So it's not that you're going to get, get it through your skin, it's the touching of the face. So if you think about it, you're wearing gloves, you take them off incorrectly, okay, and then you touch your face without washing and scrubbing your hands, you're, you're, you're at risk, right? So my advice is if you do use gloves, you have to practice good safety and then make sure immediately thereafter you use soap and water and wash your hands thoroughly for 20 seconds. So again, you have to really understand the dynamics of what you're doing and why you're doing it in order to be able to be successful at, you know, sort of fending off, you know, the, the virus um, when you're at risk. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So I skipped one before because I wanted to make sure we got to other people's food safety questions, but I'm going to go back. So what about food shortages? You know, the stories of meat plants because too many people had COVID in the Midwest and even actually in upstate New York, how how concerned should we be about food shortages in our supply? I don't want to have everybody run out and buy um, 500 rolls of toilet paper like they did when this whole thing started. But, yeah, and, I, and I, I'm not sure I understand all that, but you know, I, I I think that you know the key thing is that you know there are issues with food supply. Um, you're seeing. Um, you know, uh, plant closures um, and issues like that. So there are going to be issues around poultry, around meat and pork. Um, and there are, it's just, it's, it's, it's happening, right? So I think that that's a concern. Um, although a little less meat, a little less poultry, a little less pork might be, you know, a healthy thing. So again, I think that that's where you're going to see limits on. You're seeing, you know, you're seeing problems with yeast. You're seeing problems with flour, uh, with chocolate morsels. Um, so I think people are doing a lot of baking. But we're lucky right now that we haven't seen huge shortages. Um, but again, you know, in New York City, you know, more than 50% of our food supply comes from Hunts Point, which is in the Bronx, which is one of the um, epicenters of of this disease. And you know, my concern is, you know, if more than 50% of our, you know, uh, fruit and vegetables come from there, meat, fish, uh, I'm concerned because that area should be considered, like, um, critical, like a hospital almost, right? Those workers should be wearing every kind of protection device, masks, um, you know, shields, gloves, 
there should be gel, you know, uh, gel with 60% more alcohol everywhere. Um, and for their safety, not that I'm worried about that they're getting on the food, I'm worried about their safety and a possible potential outbreak at Hunts Point. They should be doing fever checks. Now, I don't know if they are or not doing that, but my instinct from what I know about Hunts Point is that they're probably not, but, and they're in a, a very heavily um, uh, virus ridden area. So that concerns me. So again, to generalize the advice, I think, you know, there are concerns about some food shortages. I don't think we're in a, in a place where we have to panic at all. Um, and uh, I'm not panicking, although I do have a supply of food, um, but not where I'm hoarding and have, um, I, I have a friend that lives in, in the UK and he's from Sierra Leone, so he lived through Ebola. And, uh, you know, when I said, oh, I was, you know, I had some stock of food, I showed him on, on FaceTime and he laughed because he was saying that the people of the UK, they had cupboards stocked with shelving of food. And I just thought, oh, wow, you know, that's really uh, quite a bit. So I don't recommend that, but it's nice to have uh, a few weeks supply of some staples um, and, you know, black beans and some soups if they're available and a lot of fresh produce. I don't think we're going to have a problem with fresh produce. I think green markets, if they're available, and, you know, if, if you live, you know, I live by Union Square Market, it's fantastic to be able to go to the green market and be able, and it's still open, which is, you know, phen phenomenal for people that live in that community. And, you know, the, the green markets are also being really smart. They have everything marked off so that people stay six feet apart. Um, yeah. They are They have gloves and masks for the people who are working in the market. So I would agree that, especially now that the weather is getting to be more beautiful, if you're going to take that trip out of your house, carefully masked and prepared for anything, um, a green market can be a terrific place to go and buy yourself, you know, some healthy, fresh fruits and vegetables, maybe some beautiful flowers that have come down from upstate New York, because we're all sitting and staring at the same four walls. So maybe some flowers couldn't hurt either. Um, although yeah, probably value. <laughs> well, we don't want to eat the flowers. But I but I can't, you know, stress it enough that you know, having fresh fruits and vegetables, supporting local farmers, being outside and not going inside. Not that this is, you know, terrible, but it's clear that it's easier to sustain distances, it's easier to transfer it's less uh, uh, likely to transfer the virus. Um, so there's a lot to be said for going to a farmer's market and the green market is bar none. And I think it's, 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 and you're supporting a local food economy and you can see how foods, we're lucky that truckers were still willing to come to New York and deliver food and all those kinds of things, right? Because right. you could see, you know, in, in the beginning, people were panicking and there could have been tremendous food shortages. And we were very fortunate that that didn't happen. So, but still, it's fantastic to support regional and New York State farmers that are coming to New York City. They, I remember, you know, during, you know, right after 9-11, living on Union Square, you know, uh, for the last 30 years. And, you know, I, we could not get, you know, food anywhere. Um, after Sandy, um, which was very difficult, we were blacked out, as everybody can, if anybody can remember. And the farmer's market was all, you know, was a lifesaver. Um, you know, it, it had moved to 23rd Street area. It was just unbelievable. And really, I, I cry when I talk to the director of Green Markets, you know, about it because it it's, was such a lifesaver. They are. And they're all over New York City. Um, and you can find them by going online or even calling 311 and asking where your nearest farmer's market is. And I can't reiterate any better than you did how valuable this is. And it's a win-win because when we buy food at our farmers markets, it's great for New York State farmers who are able to continue um, to get through this pandemic in, in in bad economic times for farmers also, knowing that they can come to New York City with their foods and sell them to us. So it's absolutely a win-win. And believe it or not, we've actually come to the, um, the closing time of this hour we've had together. It's amazing how quickly, quickly it went. I wanna thank you so much for your participation and sharing your expertise with us this evening. Um, I know that many people are watching on Facebook 
and we've learned that they watch for days and days afterwards. So, you know, you get there's a repeat. You can go on and watch us again if you like. Or you can come back in two weeks, same time, um, Thursday, May 28th, 7 p.m., and I'll be holding my next town hall around housing issues. There's never a lack of housing issues in New York, but the pandemic and the economic tough times have created all kinds of new issues for us to talk about and hopefully offer some constructive resources. So I want to, in closing, thank you very much, Charles. It was great having you here tonight. And thank you to my team who puts these together um, for me every week. And again, please know if there's anything my office can do to help, you can find us at our website, LizKruger.com. You can call our office. Um, you, can, you can do everything but walk in because we're not actually in the office. But you can find us and we are there trying to help any way we can. So good night to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for all you do, Liz. Thank you, Charles. This is great.